my great pleasure to welcome all of you here today to this rather intimate venue. I'm especially pleased that you have ventured out under the difficult circumstances we as the human race have to live under these days. For that, I thank you. A special thanks to Wesley, who flew all the way from Cape Town, Zane and Lumkile, for agreeing to do the main inputs today. Thank you, it's greatly appreciated. This is the first of what I'm hoping will be a series of debates and discussions <coughs> initiated by the Sunday Independent on the great issues of the day, particularly those faced by us as South Africans and as Africans. Our seminar today was prompted by an international summit for democracy convened last week by the United States and its Western allies to which 110 countries were invited and hosted by President Joe Biden. The list of those in invited included 17 sub-Saharan countries as well as South Africa, but specifically excluded Russia and China. That is excluding from an event vital to all humankind, 1.6 billion of the world's 7 billion population. The ostensible aim of the summit was to defend democracy and human rights around the globe. Some of the invited countries considered by many to be dubious democracies and the checkered records of human rights cast doubt whether the summit, whether the summit's stated objectives would be met. It seemed they were there simply to fulfill the strategic interests of the United States rather than as paragons of democracy and human rights. So the $64,000 question, as the Americans like to say, is whose version of democracy and whose version of human rights are we talking about? The aim of the US is abundantly clear on the emotional and politically loaded issue of democracy and human rights, isolate Russia and China, and grab the moral high ground. It's a useful weapon in the army <coughs> as they embark on what many experts say is a second Cold War between the US and China, especially a country Biden has classified as the main adversary of the US and the worst in the 21st century. A key question for us as Africans is where do we stand in this new adversarial relationship between East and West? We remember well when African countries were used as proxies and pawns in the previous Cold War, when, for instance, tens of thousands of Angolans and Namibians were killed in the proxy war between the US and the Soviet Union. A further deduction that can be made is that the summit was designed to impose a neo-imperialism notion of democracy and human rights on emerging and developing nations in South Africa, sorry, in South America, Asia, and Africa. As they had come Bible on hand with their notion of civilization in the 18th century and in the process stole our land and resources, is their version of democracy and human rights the new Trojan horse and at the same time pit us against the Asians? That's a question. Are we once again going to fall for the moralizing sermons of countries like the US with its own stained record on democracy and human rights? I hope somebody had the courage at last week's summit to remind Biden of the CIA's role in the overthrow of democratically elected governments in Chile and in Iran, the continued incarceration of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay without trial for almost 20 years. More pen Pertinent for us as Africans have been the role of the US and some of its Western allies to undermine democratically elected governments on the continent and violation of human rights in the so-called fight against terrorism, especially in the Horn of Africa. However, more insidious has been the role of corporate America and Europe in violating the rights of Africans who have been affronted in recent times by the hoarding of coronavirus vaccines and the exorbitant cost to poorer countries once they do make them available. Recently, we got a rude reminder of how Americans treat Africans at the outbreak of the Omicron virus, and without so much as a discussion, they put African countries in the Sadiq region on red alert, 
closing off our borders on planes coming from this end, as if the virus originated from Africa when it was all over the world. Thank God President Ramaphosa snapped their summit. Under the cloak of democracy and human rights has been the practice of pharmaceutical companies in the field of medical experimentation and the dumping of pharmaceutical products on unsuspecting communities on the continent. We have obtained a short video titled The Hidden Truth, which exposes the pain and suffering of women and children in Uganda at the hands of some of these companies. As Africans, we have also learned that in pursuit of profits, human rights are never a consideration. These pharmaceuticals or big pharma have admitted to spreading millions on gifts to secure contracts with state health service providers in order to dump on African communities, products that had been banned or restricted in the United States. Uh, thank you very, very much to Sisi Zinkisa and the team at uh, in Sunday Independent. Uh, to my esteemed respondents as well, is it, is Dr. Munkile, is Brian Munkile? Eh? Yeah. And uh, Brian Zain as well. Uh, I told them earlier that it feels a bit like I'm presenting my PhD thesis again. <laughs> and to have such eminent respondents, so I'm certainly looking forward to them uh, uh, responding uh, very vigorously to the presentation. I want to also take this opportunity in thanking uh, Buta Muhsin uh, for the invitation, certainly. Um, and to all of you for coming here today. Uh, thank you very, very much. On Friday past, uh, the world commemorated the 73rd anniversary of the adoption of the Uni Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 2008, 60 years after the adoption of the Declaration, a group of us were engaging Swedish scholars on the questions of democracy, human rights, and the politics of integration. Our conclusion then, as I am sure our conclusion would be here this afternoon, is that while the notion of human rights may be indeed universal, both in time and space, and the practice of democracy be the best among the worst forms of government, both human rights and democracy continue to be interrogated. There is one, no one model of either, and ideally, true to the geographical understanding of universal, human rights and democracy should be understood within their proper contexts and conditions. It is therefore not my intention here this afternoon to promote either a Western understanding of human rights and democracy, among others, formulated by Western philosophers such as Locke and Rawls, nor is it even my intention to promote a Chinese understanding of human rights and democracy in the thought of Munzer and later Chairman Mao. To insist on a Chinese understanding of human rights and democracy as formulated by Munzer and Chairman Mao would be to go every, against everything the Chinese have fought for in the last 70 years, imperialism. Insisting on a Western understanding of human rights and democracy, as formulated by Locke and Rawls, is exactly what happened in Washington, D.C. last week. In the immediate aftermath of the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, many across the globe, and especially in the Global South, were skeptical of the Declaration and its intent. In fact, one of the most striking ironies of the Declaration was that one of its main architects and promoters was a man by the name of Jan Christian Smuts, then Prime Minister of South Africa. If anything, Smuts' involvement with the promotion and formulation of the Declaration of Human Rights personifies the kind of hypocrisy we find today in the Western world and within Western countries themselves. While promoting and insisting on human rights elsewhere, back home they were or are exploiting people and treating them literally as non-humans. While insisting and promoting democracy, the institutions were and are far from the people and a wealthy elite, often male and Anglo-Saxon, 
continue to benefit from a system which perpetuates gross inequality. When we were engaging the Swedish scholars on the questions of human rights and democracy, the American scholar of Chinese politics and history, Elizabeth Perry, released a seminal text which I would fall in love with later in 2010 when in the UK, and which was my first exposure to Chinese thought. It is therefore my intention here today to share simply with you some ideas of the Chinese conceptions of human rights and democracy. Hopefully in sharing with you these, it will prompt us as Africans to question whether our conception of human rights and democracy is Western or not, whether this could be the reason why by and large we as Africans struggle with human rights and democracy because it is Western and we have not made it our own. Even more so, it would be interesting to highlight the domestic and foreign policy milieu that we find ourselves in as Africans and South Africans, given that, as some critics have suggested, we have moved away from the ideals of democracy and human rights, especially within our foreign policy. In fact, it would not be far-reached to suggest that these scholars, our own intelligentsia, who criticize African and South African domestic and foreign policy as having abandoned the so-called rights discourse or rights consciousness, have a very imperial and therefore Western understanding of human rights and democracy. The very genesis of our own Bill of Rights and Democracy came about during a period when liberal democracy was in vogue, even though the thought tradition of the liberation movement by and large up until then had been social democratic in nature. Neo-imperial liberal democracy adopted and promoted by South Africa would then therefore soon rattle our country with the handling or mishandling of democratic South Africa's first international embarrassment, the hanging of Ken Saru Wiwa. Little wonder the Mbeki administration, rightfully so, adopted so-called quiet diplomacy after this. The summit held last week in Washington DC must therefore be understood in its proper context. Liberal democracy across the world is in crisis today. Yet the summit is an attempt to rescue that project, as the American political scholar Samuel Huntington would call it, Project Democracy, launched under the Carter administration. Over time, the project has evolved and taken on various official names, but unofficially the world has come to know it as regime change. History is littered with ostensibly American promotion of human rights and democracy across the world. Pinochet after Allende, Sisiseko after Lumumba, the Taliban 1.0 after the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, Daesh after the invasion of Iraq, and the promotion to topple al-Assad, to mention but a few. What I will suggest today, as Elizabeth Perry's work does, which we shall traverse in a moment, and will certainly point out, is even human rights and democracy have been indigenized by the Chinese. Put differently, as with Marxist-Leninism, the Chinese have human rights and democracy with Chinese characteristics. Again, all of this may sound familiar, yet if we were to understand fully the difficulties faced by Africans and South Africans in grappling with issues of human rights and democracy, now 27 years into our own democratic dispensation, then it will become clear that we have not yet fully appreciated this need to live what I would term an Ubuntu understanding of human rights and democracy. In a seminal piece, Chinese conceptions of rights from Mencius to Mao and now, Elizabeth Perry highlights a number of pertinent points for our own understanding of human rights. Firstly, she points out that the Western understanding of post-Chairman Mao, China, is depicted as a society where Marxism has been discredited, but Chinese people have no moral compass to guide their changing and confused lives. Because of this alleged ethical and spiritual vacuum, Perry continues, we, 
that is the rest of the world, are told, millions of Chinese have turned to other forms of solace, Falun Gong, underground Christianity, and so forth. It is from within this false pro spiritual propaganda against China that I would want to suggest here this afternoon comes the propaganda we have seen in the recent times in the relation to Catholics in China, as well as what has allegedly been happening in Xinjiang and with the Uyghurs. Put differently, we are made to believe that Chinese people have no sense of faith, spirituality, and even worse still, that the state does not tolerate religion. If I may add, as someone who has lived in China for three years, practiced his faith freely, Catholicism, and who has Chinese friends who are practicing Muslims, nothing could be further from the truth. Secondly, Perry points out the appreciation by the Chinese state, in particular the Communist Party of China, of human rights since the days of the Chinese Revolution and the founding of the new China in 1949. In the year 2000, the white paper entitled 50 Years of Progress in China's Human Rights and used by Perry, the Chinese State Council writes, and I quote, Invaded and enslaved by various foreign powers, all China lost its state sovereignty and its people's human rights lost their minimum guarantee. Quote end. In other words, not only did Chinese people at one stage in their history long before the Declaration of Human Rights and before imperialism and colonialism enjoy minimum guarantee of human rights which was lost during invasion and colonialism, but China makes an intrinsic link between independence and state sovereignty on the one hand and human rights on the other. In this regard and at this point it would be interesting to note two African countries that were not invited to the Washington summit last week, Zimbabwe and Eswatini, even though only 17 African countries participated, or one less South Africa, which must be not mentioned, which has been mentioned in the media. In particular, and often unfortunately spurned on by some quarters in South Africa, Zimbabwe's sovereignty as a state has been seriously slighted. In recent times, and even with the promotion of the political party I belong to, we have sought the need to act as a big brother, as it were, and visit Zimbabwe, as if it is any of our concern, and as if we can teach the Zimbabweans anything about independence, human rights, or even democracy. Again, spurned on by this imperialist Western type of thinking of human rights and democracy, we promote policies of interference and must-go mentalities. In other words, regime change. China has the most neighbors in the world, 14 by land and 6 by sea. This fact, together with its anti-imperial and anti-colonial thinking, promotes for the sovereignty and promotes respect for the sovereignty of all states. Even in the case of Korea, China will never interfere in the domestic issues of any of its neighbors, let alone another country, because it understands this intrinsic link between the sovereignty of the state and this state, which ultimately endows its citizens with human rights. Therefore, from the days of pre-New China, human rights within Chinese society have been closely linked with this minimum standard of living, subsistence, or shangtun, and at the same time, more than this minimum standard of living, there is an expectation for fajan, development or improvement in that minimum standard of living. As Perry further points out, the notion or conception of human rights as a minimum standard of living, and that the state itself must provide this minimum standard of living as well as development, or the state's very legitimacy depends on it, goes back as far as Confucius in the 6th to 5th century before common era. These notions were then developed by the Confucian philosopher Mengzi, who directly linked economic wealth with legitimate rule. The more recent development of the necessity of the state to promote socio-economic development, to maintain social cohesion, and the state's 
legitimacy, a state run by the Communist Party of China, is one advanced by more recent Chinese leaders and philosophers such as Chairman Mao. As Perry continues to point out, these thoughts lie at the very heart of how Chinese people think and act politically, and they are not foreign to Western thinkers. For example, T.H. Marshall developed the social citizen, or the collective right to economic welfare and social security as the highest expression of citizenship. Samuel Fleischer points to distributive justice using the work of Rousseau, Smith, Kant, and Babeuf. And it must be understood that the work of philosophers such as John Locke and John Rawls, pillars on which Western political philosophy are built, emphasize the individual inalienable rights, in particular to life, liberty, and property. This contrasts to the third point made by Perry, and which could be understood as Chinese democracy. Mengzi writes Perry, was one day asked by an anxious king, what should he do in order to hold on to the throne? Mengzi answered simply, protect the people. Mengzi continued, an intelligent ruler will regulate the livelihood of the people so as to make sure in good years they shall always be abundantly satisfied and that in bad years they shall escape the danger of perishing. Thus, promoting the people's livelihood has become the statecraft of the Chinese. Again, as Elizabeth Perry points out, this thinking was developed in the 11th century before Common Era under the Zhou dynasty, when the concept of the mandate of heaven was advanced. Mengzi would develop this in linking heaven, Tsian, with the support of the people, Ren. The people are the most important element, said Mengzi. Therefore, to gain the support of the ordinary people is to become emperor. Chairman Mao himself would later come to encourage the importance of popular or specifically peasant support in establishing political legitimacy. For Chairman Mao, the revolutionary instincts of the peasantry derive from their poverty. Yet for Mengzi, the peasantry demands were limited to subsistence, whereas Chairman Mao would state that the peasants are not only demanding subsistence or minimum standard of living, but de the development as well. Colleagues, this year the Communist Party of China celebrates 100 years. The gift it has given itself is to have eliminated poverty in China. Since 1979, China has been able to lift 800 million people out of poverty. From the end of 2012 to the end of 2019, China lifted more than 10 million people out of poverty annually for seven consecutive years. Today, poverty is part of China's history. Today, China enjoys the world's largest social security system with more than 1.3 billion people covered by basic medical insurance and nearly 1 billion people covered by basic old age insurance. According to the Kennedy School of Harvard University, the Communist Party of China and the Chinese government enjoys a 93% approval rating among Chinese people, the highest in the world. China has made human rights in a democratic society visible and real for all its people. China has guaranteed all its people a minimum standard of living and has set on a path that continues the continuous development of that minimum standard of living. China is well on its way to achieving the creation of an economically comfortable family, or as the Chinese would say, a relative prosperous and modern society by 2049, the centenary celebrations of the new China. And it is in the light of this, of this great success story of democracy and human rights in China, that Project Democracy, promoted by Washington since the Cold War, must have a summit for democracy last week. Colleagues, several lessons have already been mentioned in my presentation, which for the sake of time, I do not wish to repeat. We have not even touched on the emphasis on duty duty to one's country and people, 
by the Chinese people more than that of right or rights. However, it is important for us, our promotion of human rights and the safeguarding of our democracy, to seek ways to understand these concepts within our own context. As mentioned before, as Africans, we have a deep understanding of what the Nguni languages call Ubuntu. Umtu, Gumuntu, Gabantu. Lies at the very heart of our liberation from colonialism and apartheid. It is through our recognition and appreciation that the future of all of us is indelibly linked with the future of the African girl child within our society, the most vulnerable. In fact, if anything, Ubuntu is the very antithesis to the philosophy promoted by philosophers such as Locke and Rawls, which ingrained and emphasized the inalienability of individual human rights. Yet even in the understanding of Ubuntu, my humanity and the rights as a human are not inalienable. Rather, it is bestowed upon me, or even better still, emanating from the community. Put differently, I have rights because we have rights. I have rights because I fulfill my duties towards my community. In this regard, debates continuing within our country with regards to land in particular must permeate the notion that those who currently possess land understand themselves, their livelihoods, and their futures intrinsically linked to the dispossessed. Even more so given the vast inequalities in our country, hopefully those among us who have much property will appreciate that they and their futures are unsustainable if most of our people continue to live in abject poverty. What does access to land, not just as an economic commodity, or access to what the Chinese would call a minimum standard of living, but also appreciated in its cultural, social, and even religious facets, mean in an African human rights society and African democracy? It will also be a serious amiss of me to omit a word or two on COVID-19. As we have seen throughout the world, the reactions by countries and their peoples have been very different from each other. In the Far East, people have trusted the state and adhered religiously to the regulations put out. In the Far East, for example, wearing masks has long been the culture, even if one has something as simple as the seasonal flu. The sizes of these populations have certainly inculcated a communal understanding of public health, even to the extent of not wanting to spread the seasonal flu. On the other hand, the reactions in Western countries have been individualistic, and in the extreme, the science of wearing masks and vaccinations have even been questioned. Liberalism in the West has seriously damaged the public trust that people have of their governments and state in general. Inculcated during the Reagan and Thatcher years, the malafide intent of the state or antagonism towards the state has always been haunting these Western populations and therefore in a moment of crisis as presented by COVID-19 pandemic, even governments, never mind their people, are pessimistic about the intentions of science and state bureaucrats. In Africa, the lack of building capacity and trust in the state has seriously hampered our own efforts to respond adequately to COVID-19. Our people do not have trust in the state. And not all of this can be blamed on neoliberalism that has dominated our discourse for the last three decades. Lack of providing a minimum standard of living and development, more than maybe corruption or even state capture, has been the real reasons, I would want to suggest, for this lack of confidence by our people in our governments and in our states. At the same time, one would hope that our foreign policy in particular is not pursued in the same vein as those in the West does, through neo-imperial action, that, but that we rather, like China, respect the sovereignty of states within the family of nations. A state is a state because of other states. In this way, and unlike Jan Smuts, we will not only be pursuing democracy at home, but we will certainly be respecting every country, no matter how small or large they may be.
none of the issues raised here today have been adequately exhausted. But again, I do thank you and the Sunday Independent for organizing this event, listening, and I look forward to the input made by the esteemed respondents. Sia Sia. Thank you. First respondent of the report the mask is Zain, um, well known human rights activist. She is also a special advisor to the Minister of International Relations. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Let me just grab my water there. Okay. <laughs> I've got notes in here and here because I got the paper before. So. <laughs> but, uh, thank you, Wesley. And like Wesley, I'd like to thank the Sunday Independent for organizing this discussion. Some of it will be a debate, some of it will be a discussion. I think it's very useful to have these kind of platforms where we can begin to discuss in depth um, issues of importance, you know, development, human rights, international relations. But before I go into Wesley's paper, it will be remiss of me not to make a comment on the video. In a, in a previous life, I also used to be the Director General of Social Development, which means I used to lead South Africa's delegations to functional commissions of the United Nations dealing with issues such as population development. And lo and behold, I didn't think I'd ever come into a room and discover Martin Semper in a video. Martin Semper leads a, an institution called the Rainbow Coalition in Uganda. And with the sole, sole goal of blocking anything that's to do with women's reproductive rights. Um, and ironically, as much as he talks in this video about international NGOs, Martin Semper is well funded by the Christian right wing in the US yeah. from the Arizona group. Well funded to the extent that he was the sponsor of a bill in Uganda that sought to criminalize gay relationships. Um, <laughs> and when you look at an entire video, you can see the framing of Martin Semper and what is called the, the Friends of the Family. The Friends of the Family, which is this Arizona well-funded group, which has got its footprints all over Africa. And, you know, we talk about Western <laughs> um, notions of human rights. Here's a different imposition of Western notions of, uh, of human rights. A counter-cultural revolution against women's human rights in Africa. Um, so just to reframe that video, I didn't think I'd ever find myself in the, in the space where a person like Martin Sempa would be seen as reasonable, when he's patently unreasonable, um, and in fact um, has been used as an instrument to, to roll back in not only in Uganda, but also in South Africa and other places. Um, um, not using science and evidence, but using a particular approach to spirituality, um, women's human rights. So I just wanted to mention that Zingi and Muxin. <laughs> I think it's important to mention that. Um, yeah. Coming back to, to, to the paper, I think it was a really good paper. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail in my responses. I've just got three areas I want to talk to. Is big power, politics, and global governance. I'll talk about the big power and politics and global governance in the UN. I'll then speak about <coughs> the notion of decolonization people-centered development and human rights. And I'll talk there a bit more on the dichotomy between the different forms of rights favored by, say, developing countries and, 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 and Western countries. And then I'll end with some questions, I think. <laughs> Mostly, it wasn't canvassed that much in the, in, in the, in the input, but the issue of non-intervention and what that means um, just to warn you, I speak from an international human rights perspective, but a legal perspective, and, and, the, and the politics of it as well. Okay. So on the, 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 the issues around big power politics and global governance, and, and, and Wesley's spoken about <coughs> the, 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 the charter, uh, the, the declaration, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but I want to just go back a bit further. <coughs> 
Um, so if one looks at the League of Nations itself and the founding of the League of Nations, and that is where Jan Smuts first started drafting the charter of, of, the, of the League of Nations, um, one then can see that the League of Nations was an attempt to protect what we call empire. So it was at the time when, for example, just after the, the, the big world wars um, um, and in between the Second World War, but you also had a time when, when there was the anti-colonial struggles, there was beginning to be rumbles and they needed an institution that could protect colonial powers. And, and the League of Nations was the first institution. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go through all the, the, the details of it, but if one reads the intent of the first charter, the, the intent of the first charter was to protect empire. Um, I wrote a paper on invitation of the U.S. Secretary General, which was entitled, From Defending Empire to People-Centered Global Cooperation. Because we felt, some of us felt that we needed to actually, when we talk about powers and big power, not make it in this binary manner, old Cold War style. Actually, let's talk about big powers and the trajectory of big powers. So the first big power is your colonial powers, who drafted a, a, a charter to protect their interests. Then after the, the big tribal war, <laughs> the Second World War, um, and the atrocities that Europeans and, 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 and nations of the North generally meted out on each other, and, they, the, and which is the catalyst for, the, for changing from the League of Nations, which has become, which had become incredibly weak, to the United Nations. Um, and then it was only about a group of 53 countries. I'll check the details of that. Um, again, we find that um, Jan Smuts was involved in the drafting of that charter, and it was again the kind of civilizational discourse that you saw from the League of Nations. And the civilizational discourse, just to unpack that a bit more, you know, there's a, Amy Adams is one of the researchers I quote in my paper, writes that civilizational discourse has been employed throughout history to provide the rationales for forms of domination, exploitation, and violent actions against those determined to be outside of civilized international society. Um, Amy Adams, Mark, Mazawa, and others have written about this in, in a lot more depth than I do. She, she basically talks about the, how the law of nations um, posited the idea that through universally binding law, Christian nations had a civilizational role, you know, over the less enlightened. Okay? And I think you spoke about civilizational issues as well. Moving to the UN, so there was an attempt to, to, to not use, for example, this kind of civilizational language that you had in the, in the League of Nations, but they didn't succeed. So if one reads through the charter, you'll still find the civilizational language coming out in terms of how they de dealt with what they call mandates over newly decolonized countries. And the mandating system, if you look at the pillars uh, of the UN, and of course one of those mandating systems, one of those mandates was in Palestine. And the original sin was a uh, countries, n not more than 53, meeting to decide on the fate of another country. Um, and um, 15 countries then, led by Egypt and others, voted <coughs> against it. So 35 countries decided the fate of what would happen to the Palestinian people in the end. But it just gives you a sense about this, the mandate system. So the genesis of the UN has been to about protecting empire. And like I said, the first powers were your colonial powers. But there was, with, with the end of the Second World War and the establishment of the United uh, UN Security Council and the drafting of the Charter in a way that because of the hor horrors of the Second World War, the main purpose of the UN was to regulate how the use of force, to re not to end the use of force, not to promote peace, but to regulate the use of force. And I use that purposely. Um, you know, regulate means when is law, when is the use of force legal, right? And secondly, once it's been declared legal, what can you do in the process of war? Okay, so that's where humanitarian law emerged. But only five countries can decide when the use of force is, is legal. And 
these five countries essentially because of the veto system and the structure of the Security Council have enormous power over others in the world, over developing countries. And, and this is where I, I, I would like to engage with Wesley more about it's not a binary, it's not the US versus China, is that when you talk about big powers, they may have ideological differences. They may have different positions about how to, to project power, but they are big powers. And they use that big power politics through the institutions that they control to shape what happens in the world generally. Okay. So like I said, these five countries, the US, China, Russia, UK, France, the victors of the Second World War, these were the allies. They were allied up until that point um, in the fight against Nazi Germany and, 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 and others exerts through the Security Council enormous control. If you read the UN Charter, this issues dealing with sustainable development, they have weak language like shall or may. If you look at the Charter dealing with the use of force and the Security Council, it's will, it's very purposive, and must, and it's binding. And we see that the Cold War may have ended, but in the structure of the UN Charter and the way it's organized, the institutions of global governance generally are determined by the needs and wants of these big powers. Okay? Um, they shape, for example, what happens in different parts of the world, whether it's around development, economics, around whether there will be peace or stability in particular countries, um, whether human rights will be protected or not protected, based not on a belief in those issues, but about strategic interest. Okay? It's what's our strategic interest in situation X or situation Y. Who can we work with? And it's then the politics of influence emerges. So one country will call a summit um, of 100 others that are invited, over 110, um, not with the express idea of discussing democracy and human rights, but about projecting its influence and solidifying its influence. Some will counter that because it's a counter measure to um, ensure that their interests are protected. And for Africans, now this is why at some point Africa, African countries were key partners in the non-aligned movement. Because the non-aligned movement saw itself as having to find a space between the wants and needs of the big powers so that it could find and, and reverse its own path. Given the fact that many African countries were involved in, in, in anti-colonial struggles and they received huge support from the Soviet Union and, and China, there was more of an affinity towards the kind of support provided by the Soviet Union and China, and that affinity still exists. So China is still part of the G77, which is a group, the, it's a group of 77 countries um, that also emerged um, to look at what are the development interests of the developing world and the newly decolonized countries. Um, interestingly, the OECD um, was formed directly to oppose the formation of the G77. Um, and the OECD is a lot more influential than the G77. The OECD is linked to the G20, and the OECD has found a niche, for example, in terms of determining key economic and social policies globally, and are more influential in the UN system than the G77. And this is something of the structure of power within global governance that we need to talk about. So I think just to sum up that section on, on, on global power and governance, is that there are no saints and sinners, in, in my view. There are different powers seeking to use the space that they occupy to influence their way of seeing the world. And oftentimes African countries and other developing countries are caught between, an, 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 between what they must do. And this is why you'll find that you'll have a Turkey-Africa summit, you'll have a China-Africa summit, you'll have a Russia-Africa summit, You'll have a U.S.-Africa summit, almost as if African countries 
um, are the instruments of these big powers or want to be big powers. Um, and part of the solution is for African countries and the AU to become stronger and say, if you want to talk to Africa, you're going to come to Addis Ababa or Pretoria and engage with us on our, in our space on our terms. Um, because I think the AU has become one of the biggest institutions um, in the developing South. It's more powerful than the OAU was, which is more nebulous and smaller. The AU is not perfect, but it's beginning to push um, an idea that Africa can shape its own agenda. Decolonization, people centered development and human rights. I'll try and go quickly so I can give you more, more chance to speak. So the decolonization period of the 1960s saw a desire by newly decolonized countries for the development of laws, organizations, and institutions that would dilute the authority of older sovereign states. So the older sovereign states includes all these big powers. Okay? Some of them may have been colonizers and others, to a lesser extent, have been involved in some form of empire. But you can see that they were all, all the, the big powers were in form, were, were basically some form of empire at different times, at different stages. Okay. The institutions of global governance um, must be transformed by the agency of developing countries, by South Africa, by the African Union, to move towards the concept of a life well lived. Now, there's a, a development um, economist that I quote called Thomas Bach, who developed the work of philosophers such as Aristotle to build on this concept of a well -loved, what, life well lived. Um, and Bach writes that a life well lived requires that all human needs are met equitably, and, uh, and that in an unequal globalized world, this means that the interconnected national and global institutions should be repurposed to meet these needs. But what Poch is also saying is that there's a dichotomy, and, 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 and you mentioned it as well. There's a dichotomy in the world between human rights. So the West will favor civil and political rights, the individual rights. Developing countries, because of our history, favors economic, social, and cultural rights but specifically economic rights. Um, you know, so you can talk about how China has actually created this kind of sustainable living, sustainable levels of living um, that South Africa aspires to, you know, robust social protection flows. These are often in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the institutions of global governments contested. The West refuses to, for example, recognize the right to development certain forms of the rights to health, you know, um, the rights to social security, for example, is contested, and the rights of states to use their resources in the interest of their population. Okay. And, and these are contested issues. And often developing countries are seen to be opposing civil and political rights, individual rights, but they don't do that because they don't like civil and political rights. They do it because often these have been weaponized for, you know, for regime change purposes or what we call forcible democratization processes. Um, but what we argue as South Africa and other bridging countries from the developing South is that as per the Declaration on the Right to Development, all of these rights are important. Your economic rights will be fulfilled, but if you don't have the civil and political rights to exercise them, Actually, the, this kind of development that is people-centered does not emerge. So this is what we're saying, is that you need to integrate these rights. Um, and bridging countries like us, South Africa and others in the developing world, Brazil for a long time was part of that, um, and BRICS for a long time was part of that as well, where we sought to integrate all of these rights um, in a manner that they are equal and they are seen as being interdependent and indivisible and that not one, there was no hierarchy of rights. Uh, and, and, and think that for human rights perspective, from a human rights perspective, this is something that we, we need to focus on. So, you know, for, for, from this perspective, the right to actually have access to social security, uh, a robust social protection flow, is as important as a woman's right to reproductive health. Okay. And you could see the video I was trying to, 
polarize that. Actually beginning to argue that women's rights are anti-African <laughs> because it's an imposition. Right? So, and, and this plays itself out in, the, in, in global governance and uh, it's played itself out in the, in the UN rooms that I've been involved in. So I think that's another issue for us to discuss a bit more is that when we talk about eradicating poverty in a world where people are more equal, irrespective of where they live, the best ways of building sustainable development is to break down these lagers within global government, governance. And it's not easy, because these powers are vested. The one thing that China and the US have in common <coughs> is that they will not reform the Security Council easily. <laughs> that is their space, they will protect it, and they will work together to protect it. Okay, because it's in their interest as big powers to maintain that power. Okay. The last one, I think, and there's, there's much more I wanted to say, but on non intervention, I think the. So China's got a uh, strong history, and it's a well admired history, of not intervening in the sovereign affairs of other states. They did so recently in the case of Myanmar. And we welcome that, where they actually said, with the Rohingya, and the atrocities meted out to the Rohingya, that they will take an active role in ensuring that the Rohingya people are protected. And actually found, offered ways of not just mediating, but also taking the Rohingya who were, who were pushed out of Myanmar back. But the issue of non-intervention is still a, a, a vexed one in, 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 in the global space. So the Charter of the UN, through Article 2 and its various subsections, um, essentially says that all members shall settle, settle their international disputes by peaceful means and in a manner that international peace and security and injustice are not endangered. Okay? So essentially what this says is that um, only, only the UN Security Council can authorize the use of force, which means only these five countries have the power to authorize um, force or, when necessary, block the use of force of others. But also force and non-forceable measures, which includes sanctions, remain the domain of the Security Council. And this is a good thing, right, to a certain extent, because it, it, it acts as a break towards unilateral use of power. And we've seen the impact of unilateral use of sanctions in Venezuela, the blockade of Cuba. We've seen the impact this has. Okay? But there is a question that we must ask. When does non-interference end and where does solidarity action begin? Because the chart is quite clear, right? You can, non-interference is a principle. It's part of international law. But they've seen loopholes. If there is a massacre, a genocide, can you intervene or can't you intervene? Again, you can only go back to the Security Council and these five countries can decide whether action can or cannot be taken. The African Union, for example, has decided that they will take a different perspective on this and use the term non-indifference. Non so the, through the Peace and Security Council of the, of the African Union has decided that where there's evidence of genocide, of war crimes and crimes against humanity, through the use, and, and, and legitimate, through the use of regional forces, will engage in the affairs of sovereign states, where it's in the interest not only of the region, but also of the people affected by genocides, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The big sort of the three of the four horses of the apocalypse. It's interesting that war of aggression is not there. Now, war of aggression is when states act belligerently towards other states. And we know that the belligerent states are again with few exceptions, your big powerful states. And that's why none of the big, well, the three main players in the big five, China, Russia, and the US, are not signatories to the, C, um, the ICC, not only because of the lack of wanting, not wanting to be accountable to others, but because of the war of aggression, which is a crime, will make them or their actions subject to the scrutiny of others. Okay. So I think that non-interference, Wesley, I think we need to discuss
um, you know, based on the African Union example where they will say, we will intervene and then we will report back to the Security Council if we have to intervene without the authority. Okay. But again, in the main, that's a, a debatable issue. They have to go to the Security Council. Um, so the principle of non-interference is important because oftentimes it's not just when we talk about the, the Ubuntu you were speaking about, the, the relationships between states, often what happens is a status quo maintenance engagement and people get lost in that space. So as diplomats we will sit around the table and we'll find a way of ensuring that as states we engage with each other so that we maintain the peace between states, sometimes at the expense of people. <laughs> we can debate, right? We can debate it. Because the status quo maintenance engagement means that we want peace between us, we want order between states, and oftentimes it means the root cause of instability, violence, whether it's racism, xenophobia, is neglected. So, for example, does, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish now. <laughs> Does the principle of non-interference stop South Africa from pushing a resolution at the Human Rights Council around Black Lives Matter in the US, where we have evidence of systemic discrimination based on race? Okay. What do we do when there's systemic evidence of discrimination and violence based on religion and origin? Systemic. Systemic means it's widespread, it's governed by laws, and the state is involved. It's not just the people doing it. It requires state action, okay? And these are questions that we have to ask ourselves. So I'm gonna conclude by saying, what does this mean for a country like us in South Africa? So we in the Security Council over the last two years treaded an independent path in the main. People expected us to be voting with the Soviet Union in China, and we didn't all the time. We looked at each particular resolution on its merits and made a decision based on what we felt was in line with our constitutional principles and our broader mandating environment. And that is where we got the criticisms that, you know, we are moving away from our um, traditional human rights based approach when, for example, we didn't vote in certain um, um, human issues around humanitarian affairs because we felt that actually in that specific resolution we had the rational reason to deviate from it because the main purpose and intent of that resolution wasn't really human rights. It was something else. Um, and that independent path is something that we need to protect. And if we explain it more to the, to the, the world community and we are consistent, we build respect. So all the big powers will then understand why we take certain actions and why we make certain decisions. And if we are consistent, they will actually develop more understanding of why we're doing certain things. And understanding is often more important than agreement. Because actually as we build understanding, later on the agreement will come. So I'll conclude by saying that my approach is that there's no boundary between the, 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 the big global powers. Big global powers are big global powers. They use the machinery that they have at hand to exert influence. And we need, to be assure, we need to ensure that we are able to understand what we want um, and together with others who are in a similar position, craft out a different world that is more equal, that isn't big power centered, that is more amenable to people centered development. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, I'll hand over to Tulumkile. He's a lecturer at this university to, to respond. Thank you. Yeah, let me just start. Uh, uh, good, good evening. Uh, thanks uh, uh, again to the independent organizing this. Let me start where um, Zain ended. Uh, that, you know, we are dealing in South Africa. Uh, with these global powers that have got their own interests. So um, we talk, Wesley talk about the, Ch the Chinese way of human rights. And we all know that in 1980, uh, them basically uh, asserted the China dream. 
the China dream, remembering the good old days of imperial China. So where do we find ourselves? So I was quite excited that uh, you start Wesley with were with smarts and, and so did Zane. So let me also start there and abuse <laughs> that, that right. That smarts for me is fascinating because he's an architect um, of what uh, Bill Frund um, argues is the apartheid of the state. So here is a man of the minds. Uh, he's really embedded in the British imperial project. So he's a lackey of the British. But within that, there is this conflict uh, within him of developing capabilities within South Africa, with both um, Van der Beyl um, on one hand, on the other, Robert Nutzie around the rebel infrastructure. So here you've got someone who's embedded in this, but you know, believes in this. So when we see him playing a bigger role in the formation of the League of Nations, um, and, the, and our role at that time around the declaration uh, signifies the ambition of arguably um, a developmental state, which itself is conflicted, as Posen uh, argues, uh, this Deborah Posen, that what you see within the apartheid state is a conflict where they see themselves as Western in the sense that they see themselves best in the African continent with a huge industrial base located uh, in the Cold War with these big superpowers, which smarts are driven. But at the same time, being in Africa, so there is this confusion being of the Africaners, uh, the apartheid project, of being Western, uh, embedded in these global institutions that Zane was, uh, was, was, was presenting uh, so eloquently at the same time being African. And this is a very good weapon that our struggle then embeds itself. Because for us to convince solidarity internationally, we use the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and we, we espouse the democratic um, project uh, as the oppressed um, black people in South Africa. And this builds and coalesces a number um, of uh, civil movements across these various nations um, that you've talked about. That because we're embedded in infrastructure, our struggle is just, and therefore it is worth the cost, not only for liberation movements who are spreading the words internationally, but even domestically within the liberal community. It starts in, in inspiring those that have liberal values, that understand the declaration, and therefore are sympathetic to the plight of the black oppressed. So this is what we, this is how I, when I was reading your paper, and bring it back home, this is what was going through uh, as I was in this paper. Of importance for me, um, in, in, in really articulating that, is that even, the ANC particularly itself is located within, as a liberation movement, is located within this um, Western um, um, narratives. For example, when it's fighting um, for sanctions, um, citing IPM, for example, I think that, you know what, why are you selling computers to South Africa? Because the South Africans are using it to keep their base for comrades who they, who, who they are going to eliminate. So we see this play within the liberation movements, also themselves buying into, into this um, notion of being Western, but at the same, therefore, being Western means taking those uh, values uh, and clauses of human rights uh, declaration, You're putting them in because you aspire to Western to be democratic, to be liberal. And they do so even in the critique uh, of South Africa's relationships, uh, which is articulated very well uh, in the film. Uh, those of you that have seen the film, um, I don't know the title, but it's a film ab about the murder of uh, Comrade September in France. It's a, it's a film about the nuclear project of the apartheid regime. So you see the ANC there also embedding itself in the same project of being anti-nuclear. 
So all the stuff, all the debates that we're having today around our own uh, capabilities, around energy generation, about nuclearity, about climate change, these are the institutions and ideas that have haunted us in historical uh, sense. And therefore, how we react to them, arguably, is that South Africa has reacted um, to them in the way that uh, you've articulated very well, Wesley, that we found ourselves embedded in the westernness, which the, 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 the mass regime had embedded South Africa in, and therefore we continued that. Where, in fact, it gets exciting for me in your paper, um, particularly the Chinese story, uh, is really a very, very interesting story that can never be replicated anywhere. The Chinese story is their story. It's not going to be replicable anywhere in the world. So, Ang, Yuan Wen Ang, one of the scholars that I enjoy and follow, who writes in China, she's based at the University of Michigan. She talks about uh, President Xi um, having been um, a man with rules. He talks about him articulating what he calls black rules, red rules, and gray rules. So for Ang, the red rules are the instructions that come from Xi about where China is going. So in, in 2012, uh, for example, it was very clear that the biggest issue was to ensure that poverty is eliminated completely. It was to finish the job that Deng had started. Um, and there was a huge drive. So this red instruction, when it went to the people on the ground, uh, because him coming from Zhejiang, uh, whatever the right uh, uh, Chinese spelling, uh, um, Chinese pronunciation is, him coming from there, that becomes a center of how to implement it. So we see from that red instruction going to black, that is the, the operatives or the bureaucrats implementing this, pro, uh, this, this project that is being done so in a very violent way. So people are being forced to move because the target has to be met. So violently, the, if the Chinese bureaucrats cannot meet those targets of limiting poverty, they move some forcefully from the rural areas to the urban areas uh, to ensure that they are able to deal with access to infrastructure, access to jobs, uh, and, and therefore reduction of poverty. So the story that you are articulating around emissional poverty has had huge human rights cost, uh, which will never be able to, uh, to account for. China will never be able to account for because it's the Chinese way of doing things. The, the gray part, the gray part, so you've got black, you've got red, you've got, red you've got black, the gray part, is really to the extent to which, therefore, when China talks about the Silk Road a project, how much is it committed to Africa's development? Because this, and for you to get a notion, understanding of how committed they are, you're going to go back to them, to the then 1980s project around a Chinese dream, the Chinese dream being a superpower. So therefore, uh, moving towards to a uh, conclusion, is that in the African context, there is a battle around human rights um, and around what to do. So if you look at Cameroon, for example, Cameroon has used language um, and military uh, for conquest. So the, 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 the Francophone um, uh, Cameroonians have completely disempowered um, the, the Anglophone um, Cameroonians. Um, in terms of how they can progress, etc., by imposing um, uh, French as, uh, as a language, but more importantly also by using military in the pursuance of what they see as their project of democracy um, and development. Similarly, uh, you, uh, if you look at Nyerere's Ujamaa's project, you see also how an attempt around really articulating a different style of development of human rights um, in the general project. And then we we'll come back to, your, to the final point around Ubuntu. So Ubuntu in South Africa has to be understood in South Africa within the post-1994 project. Basically, 
that a government led by black people has stood um, for 27 years and witnessed and played a bigger part in the impoverishment of black people. So uh, black people today can never get jobs because the 4.9% employment that we have, so sorry, the 4.9% unemployment. So if you are black, um, you only, in a, group, in a group of about 10, uh, only about six can get a job in South Africa. In fact, others argue on the expanded that only five out of 10 can get a job in South Africa. This is the country um, Zane will know very much better than I do around the poverty and inequality and his role in, uh, in his previous role around addressing this. This is true a black government. So what I'm saying is that really for Africans, it is a continuous struggle ab about uh, democracy, about human rights and development. And hence it's not surprising that for Africans, there has been various ways of how to address that. One of the best ways is exit. So we see a huge migration in the African continent um, to, to the West uh, and, and also to, um, uh, to, to Europe, uh, to the West, I mean America, and also, also to Europe. So it seems to me that in the South African case, the recent elections have shown us that there is progress in South Africa, uh, a complete mistrust of a regime uh, that self self that's not concerned about uh, about human rights, um, that's not concerned about equality, and the very same principles that many people fought for. And therefore, how we get to uh, reconstructing a new human rights, a new developmental um, regime, remains a huge challenge. And Many, it's not surprising, therefore, that many have chosen the choices I've made of exiting. Basically, uh, for many, it takes people back um, to our black consciousness movement that perhaps in the South African case, even in the African case for that matter, black men and women are on their own. Thank you. Thank you.